Tyson Trunkill, retired U.S. Army Captain, um, field artillery officer. I served in the Iowa National Guard for almost 21 and a half years. Um, did a 16 and a half month deployment to Anbar Province, Iraq, where I was a company level fire support officer with an infantry company. Part of our my duties there was to um, run a forward security element for our convoys that we did in and out of uh, Iraq and the, and the West. Because of my job, I was in the forward security element majority of the time to control air support and direct them to um, IEDs or suspected hazard areas that we had been briefed on prior to our convoys uh, leaving the base. escort 150 civilian driven uh, semi trucks and trailers that would haul all the supplies in and out of um, Iraq through Jordan um, and oftentimes they were they were driven by what we call third country third country nationals which would be Jordanians um, other gentlemen of Middle Eastern descent um, and other countries just European countries um, we escorted these with, you know, our military Humvees and, and gun trucks of other sorts. Uh, the one particular incident that I was involved in, we had stopped at a checkpoint. Um, we were stopped securing this clover leaf, and an IED had gone off on one of these TCN diesel fuel trucks. The truck had uh, disabled and actually gone off the road, <clears throat> off the cloverleaf exchange through the ditch and up towards the back of my vehicle and stopped short probably by 50 meters or so. My gunner could see this from his turret. Uh, my vehicle was faced away from where the explosion had happened, so I was looking out the front window, didn't see it. We could hear it, we could hear the debris hitting the vehicle. Um, but my gunner could spin the turret around and he saw the, the truck come off the ramp. Um, and he was telling us what happened, that the driver had actually survived. He's standing next to our vehicle and his arm had been completely removed, cut off from a, a piece of shrapnel, we're assuming, um, at the shoulder. Um, at this time, more medics had arrived on scene and the medic that was with myself and I decided that we were going to go back towards the, the semi-vehicle that he had been driving, the truck, and you know, see if we can find the arm. EOD, Explosive Ordnance Disposal Team, had also arrived on site um, about that same time and had driven their vehicle close to where the IED had gone off from. Um, in this particular case, the IED was uh, what we would call a, a base station style with so it's basically like a cordless phone that you would find in the United States here um, where the base station would be the part that we'd have in your house that mounted to your wall and they would they would trigger them with the handset so the cordless part so they have an extensive range of you know several hundred meters so they wouldn't have to be close to trigger these so as EOD arrived on scene I was maneuvering towards the back of the vehicle um, just doing a perimeter sweep uh, as I approached the back of the vehicle, I saw the EOD tech exit the vehicle. He began to walk to the base station. He knelt down to pick up the base station, and all hell broke loose at that point. It actually, he reached down to pick it up, and the base station just exploded out from under him. He was killed instantly. Uh, he in a lack of better terms, he was completely, for the most part, vaporized. Dirt and sand and body parts, whatever was left of him, um, was kind of raining down around me, uh, hitting the vehicle, the back of the semi-tanker truck. I could hear it pinging off that. Just one of the gentlemen's, the EOD tech's legs was actually blown up against the side of the vehicle. A chunk of his torso had been thrown through the air. Uh, probably 100 meters or more. 
probably the most violent thing that I've ever witnessed in my life. Um, yeah, that's just one of the, the unique experiences that um, led me to a PTSD diagnosis and kind of the driving force behind um, myself wanting to help other veterans that are struggling um, with PTSD uh, or other issues or just need a release. <clears throat> an even greater issue for me coping with mentally when soldiers return home you see your soldiers out I mean regular army do too but you know these are the same guys you work with and you know you see them out at sporting events and you know they're normal civilian jobs uh, several incidences I you know happened to run into the soldier the guys that I had been deployed with before that I knew fairly well uh, you know, so it, it hurts even more that you had to tell their loved ones that that soldier was injured, but then we, we would see them after, you know, and I didn't know most of them, some of them I didn't know their wives or spouses, girlfriends, fiancés, whatever they were, you know, and they would, we'd introduce ourselves as you see them in public, you know, hey, this is Captain Trunkill, you know, and you, the look on their face just goes blank, and they say, oh, you're the guy that called me when my soldier was, you know, severely injured and medevaced off the battlefield. It, you know, it, there, there's not words to describe how you, how you react to their reaction of, you know, you delivered me the worst news of my life. You know, most of them, I don't believe they're angry at me, but you know, it's kind of a loss of words on, from both sides on how to handle that situation. We own Sticks and Stones Archery, which is a archery shop. Through that, we started the Dust Off Project to get archery equipment into the hands of law enforcement officers and firefighters, paramedics, first responders, and to help other service members with PTSD. The way the Dust Off Project works, we get equipment donated to us, make sure the equipment's um, safe and good for the, the recipient to use and set them up. PTSD is different for everybody. As a disease, it affects people differently. Loud noises affect them. Um, you know, the panic attacks, the suicidal depression. For myself, I used alcohol to suppress uh, my feelings, my, my PTSD symptoms um, for a long time. Uh, and it was not normally to the blackout drunk state. It was, you know, I would drink at home, uh, avoid social uh, interaction, I guess. So I was a lot of alone time at my home, uh, drinking beer on my couch. It was normally drink a beer or two before you leave the house and then hope that that activity that there was drinks available or alcohol available to get me through that and deal with interacting with other people. As of now I'm four years sober I believe and then I, I got involved with service dogs and that's kind of what what changed my my outlook, I guess, is having a dog around all the time. I was distracted. I wasn't focused on, you know, the other people around me and the hustle and bustle of sporting events and other activities, and I was focused on the dog. If you look at the HHA USA page um, and some of the Facebook pages, uh, posts from the Dust Off Project, you'll see us all together, you know, living life again, um, experiencing these, the camaraderie that you know some of us miss from being out of the service and you know you get to be with people that are that are like you but, and you can talk about it as much as you want or not and just hang out and take it in um, and but we often get to hear everybody's kind of amazing story of you know their service and we appreciate them sharing that with us um, and just 
keep looking forward to developing the Dust Off project and working with HHA USA and their other partners. You don't want to say anything? No. I don't like listening to your story because it's tough. Another day. And I said I was never going to listen to it again, and here I am. <laughs>